morning everyone a couple of minutes late starting today I hope that's okay I am just getting organized to get going I'm gonna try to do a bit of a Copic tutorial today um, the watercolor information session I guess for lack of a better term that I put together last week was really well received by my mapping group and there have been a few people asking for a similar kind of uh, run through for Copic markers and I am in a position to actually be able to do something about that so um, again the same with the watercolor I'm self-taught I'm in no way an expert um, what I know I know from reading online uh, watching other people's YouTube tutorials and just monkeying around on my own so take anything that you see here as hard one experience but also definitely not the limit of what can be learned on the subject and uh, we will commence to some exploration so if you know what a Copic is then you've probably arrived here intentionally uh, Copic is an alcohol based marker system that was developed in Japan quite a while ago um, it's very very common in the cartoony and um, manga drawing community the reason why it's so exceptional is because they blend beautifully. Um, you can go in and out with a Copic uh, almost to an infinite degree. Like the markers don't ever really cure in a permanent state. So because they're alcohol based, you could go back into it with another Copic years down the road and you'll be able to manipulate that color again. Um, it doesn't fix down the way, for example, like an acrylic paint would, where it just plasticizes and you can no longer move it past a certain point. These, you can always go back into them later, which is kind of great when you're not sure <laughs> that you're done with something. Uh, if you need to leave a project and then come back to it, you don't have to worry about uh, starting everything up again from scratch because maybe you've been away from it too long or anything like that. If you decide you absolutely must change something, it can be done. And that gives it a lot of flexibility, which I think is really, really great. Um, the other major benefit to Copic is that, like I said before, they blend incredibly. Um, they have a wonderful luminosity to them that puts down the pigment while still giving you the light reflection off of your white paper. Um, and they don't mess up the surface of your paper. Because they're alcohol-based, they're a dye uh, more than a paint. And so that means that they're not... Um, I don't even know how to, they're, they're more penetrating the paper than like washing over it and then being absorbed by it. Probably not the best science example, but it is very different from how a watercolor would work. Um, because they are a dye, they are not in fact light fast. So this is important to know if you're creating a piece of art that you're expecting to have hang in a sunny space. Um, they will last for quite some time, even in direct sun, but if you want it to be something that lasts for ages, then you're going to want to have that out of the sun. For most of us who draw in sketchbooks or are placing our art for view in places like galleries that aren't dealing with a lot of windows or something like that, this is never going to be a problem. Um, they're not just going to spontaneously fade uh, over time. It's, it's going to take that UV input, um, but because they aren't um, light fast in that regard. It's just something to be aware of if you've got something going on later down the road. So there are a couple different kinds of Copics. Um, and I don't have all of them here to show you, but I'll show you the two that I do have and just give you a brief overview of the other ones. So the first one is the Classic, which I do not have. Uh, the benefit of the Classic is that it's got a square body. It's more shaped like a softly rounded square, kind of like that. Um, that can be really nice depending on how you like to hold things. Um, depends on like for your fingers. Um, they hold the most ink out of any of the Copic line. So you can refill them nine times off of one of the ink refills and I'll show you those in a minute. Um, but you can go longer between refills with them, and that's a distinct advantage if you're someone who's working a lot with one color. Um, sorry, I'm saying um a lot today. Don't mean to. <laughs> it comes with two tips, just like the sketch that I'm holding does. On one side, it's going to have a broad chisel tip, which is going to look like this. It's just going to be wider on this end. This one's a medium. And then on the other side, it's a fine nib. 
And so that looks more like a traditional bullet point pen tip. Um, it's nice and like small enough to get into fine detail work, but it lays down beautifully. So you're not worried about having to try and leave lines in behind. Uh, that's, I think my favorite thing about Copic is they just don't. Um, there are, however, nine other nib options that can go into one of the square classics. Um, this is the largest range of nibs available for a Copic system, and they go up to and including two different kinds of calligraphy nibs, uh, which is unique to the classic Copic. Uh, you can't get the calligraphy nibs in any other ones. So if you're interested in more information about that specific set of nibs, it's probably best to go check their website. Um, there's more information there. I cannot write today, my goodness. Um, the thing about the classic is that there's 214 colors. Okay, so this becomes important because the range of color that's available for Copic is quite broad, but they're not all available in every single shape. So that's an important thing to know if you're going to decide to start from scratch and start investing in this, is that the type of body that you're working with may affect the ability that you have to get all of the colors that you want. So this is the classic. The second is the sketch, which has kind of this oblong oval shape in the body. This is the set that I have invested the most heavily in. Um, holding one here in my hand. It's got the same dual endedness that a classic would have, just different tips. So like we went over before, this one is a medium broad tip. Oh, come on, focus. There we go. And this one is what they're calling the super brush tip. I absolutely love the responsiveness of this. Um, it can give you a lot of really fabulous line variation. And I just love the ability to go from really thin to really thick. It just allows for a lot more dynamism while you're drawing. So you have those two options. Uh, it comes in 358 colors, I think it is, which is the widest range out of all of the Copics. Uh, I started collecting the sketch markers for that reason, combined with the fact that I like how this shape fits in my hand the best. Um, and there are still uh, other nib options for this one. There's only three though, and they don't include the calligraphy. So if you're someone who really likes to do a lot of lettering and that kind of thing, sketch is probably not gonna be your go-to unless you're really into like the brush tip lettering and not necessarily the calligraphy tip lettering. So there are, what was I going to say here? There we go, refills. A Copic sketch marker can be refilled about 12 times off of a refill. Um, so that means they don't hold quite as much ink in a stretch as a classic square bodied Copic marker will. Um, however, that said, they're not difficult to re-ink at all. And you can still basically get the equivalent of 12 new markers out of one refill, which is another reason why I absolutely love this setup. The third kind, which I don't have on me, is probably the most affordable of the bunch. They come in a round body like this, and it's the Chow, as in like the Italian greeting. Chow has 180 colors, so it's a really good range, but it's definitely lower than the classic and the sketch. Um, however, these are probably the most affordable because they are a smaller marker. They hold a lot less ink at a time. Um, and so people tend to go into these if they're just starting out because it's less of an upfront money investment to get into a set of chow markers than it is to get into a sketch or a classic. Um, they do have the round body. They feel the most like a pen when you're working with them. So if that's a consideration for you, that's definitely something to keep in mind. They're just slightly larger than like a standard Crayola marker that you would have like out of your school uh, pencil kit or something like that. So they're really familiar and easy to use. Um, because they're small, they're also really easy to transport. So if you're somebody who's doing a lot of traveling, then that can be really useful to you. Um, even my sketches, like a set of 12 comes in a box that goes with me like that. I've been hauling my sets of um, 72 with me to shows lately. And I'll just try to run this under the camera here. It's, it's a big box. So like to try and transport this many in one go, it can be annoying, like I've actually, I don't know if you can see it, busted off a corner of the carrying case here. So there are probably other solutions that I could be availing myself of in that regard, but I haven't yet. The chow, on the other hand, just kind of 
eliminate some of those problems just by being smaller and easier to deal with. They also have uh, two types of nibs on them. There's a medium broad chisel, so exactly this one that we have on the sketch. And there is a super brush nib, so exactly like this as well, just smaller. Uh, there are, however, ugh, there are, however, only two nib options. So those two nibs are all you're going to get on a child. There's nothing else that you can sub out for. If that's not a problem for you, then that's great. For other people, that might be a limitation of the platform. One of the cool things about the child that doesn't exist on the other formats, though, is that they advertise that there's a child safe cap. Um, on the child lids, there's actually like a small hole in each end of the cap. Um, and I find it interesting that that exists on the chow and not on anything else. I'm not really sure what the metric was for that. Maybe the fact that you might be giving them to children or it wasn't really explained on their website when I was rooting around there earlier today. So yeah, chow is probably your most affordable option if you want to get going, but it is going to have its own trade-offs for sure. Um, the last kind that they sell currently are the Copic Wide Markers. And I have a box of these here. These I've found have been harder to find. Um, they come in an 18 millimeter broad uh, nib or a calligraphy nib, I think. Uh, they have a very flat body, like you can see here. It's kind of like thin, but really, really wide. So that's actually, for me, really comfortable in my hand. I know some people find it a little awkward. Um, you can refill them seven times off of a standard refill. Um, and what they're great for is just when you need to lay down a lot of color all at once and get that covered up. So you just keep laying things down until it gets nice and smooth and homogenous. And it covers a lot of area really, really quickly. I don't find I have as much use for the wides as I could probably because of the scale that I work at. I'm typically working at an 8 by 10 or 11 by 17 and that just is small compared to what the width of this nib is. It is really fun for working on lettering though, not that I'm terribly good at it, but it's something that I'm trying to get better at. Um, Let's talk about the refills really quick here. So, Copic sells refills, and they look like this. And these can be used to refill any of those marker systems. If it takes a Copic ink, then this refill will fill it. Um, it's a really simple kind of eyedropper setup. Um, it's got little measuring ticks here along this edge. Let's see if I can get that. There we go. So you can see how much you've got left in the bottle. Um, different markers will, if you look online, let you know how many ticks roughly an empty marker will take to fill. I've always just kind of eyeballed it. Um, the ink is beautiful, even just like this. And if you have the desire to use it straight out of the bottle like this, you can. There's nothing to stop you by any means. Um, Re-inking a marker is really, really simple. Let me just find this one and I will show you guys what that actually looks like. All right, so I've got ink on myself. This is B32, which is pale blue. And I'll get into how they tell them all apart in a second here. So what you want to do is I always re-ink on the chisel tip just because it's a little bit easier to see. So open your chisel tip, hold the marker at a slight angle, and then just take your ink bottle and drip it down onto the chisel tip, just a dropper at a time. And you'll be able to see it absorb into the filament of the marker. And as it disappears, you can add another drop. You'll know that it's full when you start to see pooling up in this little lip here, or you start to get blobbing. So when you get blobbing, the easiest way to solve that is just put your marker down on the paper and bleed it off again and it'll just bleed out the extra that you no longer need. Um, and then you're good to go. If you do find that you're getting blobbing at a point in time when you're not um, refilling, it could just be that the air pressure in the marker has changed. I've been reading about this a bit online lately because I was having it happen and I didn't really understand what was going on. And Copic says that it can happen if the air pressure in the marker is uneven. So what they recommend is just take off both caps and put it down and let it sit for a minute. And apparently that opens up whatever vacuum system is going on inside the marker and it kind of recalibrates things, any bubbles or 
other voodoo that's going on on the inside of the marker can sort itself out. And then after you've given it a minute, just cap it back up and it should be good to go again. I'm going to try it. I haven't given that a shot yet, but I had some that were blowing on me recently and I was not thrilled about it because it just about ruined a piece that I was working on. All right, so some people want to know if they get their markers, if they should store them like horizontally or vertically. Uh, Copic says it doesn't matter. If you have a set, you can store them flat on your desk. You can put them up in the fancy stands, whatever works for you. Um, there are lots of storage options. Uh, Copic sells the plastic cases, uh, like the one that I was showing you before. They come in a variety of sizes. I've got a smaller one here. So this is one that just holds 12, um, but I've got cases that go up to as big as 72 for the sketch. Um, there are rolling cases that you can get that unroll and roll back up, kind of like the ones that I had my paintbrushes in for the watercolor thing that I did last week. Basically, anything that you find that works for you, use, because it's really dependent on how these are going to be best accessible to you. Uh, I started out with a collection of 12, and so the tiny little case was absolutely perfect for me. Uh, now that I have the larger boxes and I'm continuing to grow the collection, it's taking me a little bit more sorting out as to how I'm going to keep them, how I'm going to transport them, and even how they're going to be organized within those cases. Uh, I was going to talk about the blacks for a second. If you're going through the Copic black or the Copic marker system in general, you'll notice that there are two blacks. One black is the black 100 and it's just labeled as black. And the other black is 110 and it's labeled as special black. On most papers, these will look identical. Um, every now and then you'll be onto a paper type where it's not immediately obvious. Um, sorry, it is more obvious that they are not the same. Like for example, this Bristol, it looks identical. Um, but I've been on other papers where they, they are obviously different. So according to Copic, the difference is that the 100 is a quote unquote true deep black and the 110 is actually a neutral gray. It's just a very, very, very deep one. So depending on what kind of paper you're on to get the effect that you want, you're going to want one or the other. Right now, I have yet to run into a situation where it seems to make a difference. Um, I, both, I ended up with both of these in different sets that were given to me or that I purchased and I just grab for whichever one. It hasn't made too much of a difference to me, but I know for other people that can be something that's important to them. So given that it's the only color that really has like two versions of the same thing, I thought I would bring that up. So let's talk for a minute about how Copic labels its stuff, because this was the part that I was the most confused about when I got started. So what we have here is, let's see, yeah, you can see it. So BG49, which is duck blue. So the way that Copic's color system works, this BG that's at the front stands for blue green, and it's the color family that the marker belongs to. And so Copic goes around the entire color wheel and divides it up into families such as yellow, yellow green, green, and that way it kind of helps to start broad stroking your markers down into different areas that coordinate together. The first number after the color family designator, so in this case it's a four, is your saturation number. So a saturation range for Copic markers goes from zero to nine. Zero is the most saturated, so they are going to be the most intense, the brightest, the boldest colors. And the higher the number, so for example, nine, would be the least saturated. So those are going to be your quieter colors. They're going to be pastels. They're going to be translucent. Some of them are barely there. Um, this is one of the brilliant things about a Copic marker system because you can go from like super bold black to a barely there gray. And the range is incredible. It gives you a lot of options for when you're working. The second number that's here after this four, we have a nine, and this is the brightness number. So again, there's a range of zero to nine. In this case, the lower the number, the lighter the color, and the higher the number, the darker the color. So in this case, we have a four, 
which is going to be a moderately saturated blue-green, and we have a 9, which is going to be a darker, moderately saturated blue-green. So when you go to swatch this color, it looks like that. Now, understanding how this color name system works was the biggest challenge for me with Copics. I'd been using them for quite a while before I figured out how to actually navigate that in a way that made sense for me. Uh, one of the things that really helped with that is they sell this notebook. Uh, I got mine for $8.05. Um, and what it is, you can make your own by all means. Um, I just bought theirs because it was there and I was frustrated. <laughs> Um, it's it's basically a bingo card of sorts that gives you a box that you can put in every color that you have. They recommend that you fill the box with one stroke so that you're not going over it multiple times, which will change the saturation of your marker on the paper. And then you have a record of which ones you have that you can take with you when you go shopping. So for this example, it lives in my bag. Um, I just keep it in the front pocket with my gym lock and that way I know I've got it because um, there's nothing worse than driving two hours to go to the art store and realizing, I don't know if I own this marker or not. So one of the ways that you can use this book to your advantage is it coordinates um, lines within a color family. So if you go along this line, this will take you through a natural progression of color from lightest to darkest going across the top. So let me get a card where they're all filled in, and then I can show you. Okay. So, is that visible? That's visible. So you can see that these are all similar tones. And part of how you can tell this is that they all are all E's going across, and they're all 2's. So that means they're going to have the same saturation range. And then what's varying here is the brightness number. So this is a 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. And so you're going from paler to darker. And it's the same thing with the next line. They're all E's, they're all 3's, and then the brightness is changing as we go down the line. And again, E for brightness is changing as we go down the line. So why this is super useful is you will know you can create impeccable gradient if you go along this particular row. You also know that you can coordinate going in this direction most of the time. Um, based on how they interact with each other. This is a lot handier for me than just guessing and going, oh, now I don't know why these things don't look like they go together. Because if I'm going just off of the caps, for example, sometimes there are colors I think that go together that really don't when I get them onto paper. So having this is a great little shortcut, just basically a set of paint chips to kind of help me go, oh yeah, I was thinking about this, I was thinking about that, that's going to work or that won't. And I find it worth having. I know tons of people who have just drawn their own. Um, the biggest thing is just make sure you're having all your swatches on the same kind of paper because like any art product, it will show up differently on different kinds of paper. Um, and then yeah, just make sure you've got it so that it can be useful to you in the moment that you need it. I do feel it is a bit like playing bingo for me. I get really satisfied when I have a line across or a full card. Um, I've got... I don't know, 160 of them now. <laughs> I've been building this collection for a couple years and I'm looking forward to having them all. They're kind of my Pokemon. I just need to catch them all. It's my plan. So I do recommend something like this color book. Um, if anything, it just helps you learn kind of how things smooth together, which lets you blend them better on the paper. So I talked a little bit already about the refills. I think we covered that. Um, the only thing I'd recommend for refills is just storing them in like a Ziploc or head up so that you don't have any risk of leaks. They're honestly really solid. I've never had a problem with them leaking. I know that this one is, but that's for me being clumsy with my marker just this morning. That wasn't pre-existing. I have yet to find like a custom Copic made storage solution for the ink tanks. I don't know if I haven't been looking hard enough. Or what but I do find that I need something now like I'm getting enough of them together that they're kind of like a troop of manatees and they need a place to live so I do love this aspect of the Copic you can take the refills you can replace the nibs I had some nibs I was gonna show you guys where did they go so you can replace the nibs 
functionally every single part of this marker can be dealt with without you having to throw out the plastic marker body. And I really, really like that. I think that it is one of the most environmentally responsible uh, art supply setups I've ever seen. I think that that's important because especially those of us that work a lot with pen and ink, um, when we're using non-refillable pens, we just need to be aware of the fact that this is ultimately still going to become landfill fodder and plastic does take forever to go away, if ever. So I like the fact that I have the option of repairing a nib by replacing it instead of just throwing out a whole pen and starting again. So I like this part. I think it's really cool. Um, and you can get nibs, um, as I was saying when I was going through the rundown, of different kinds that fit onto the various pens. So if you really want to be working on calligraphy with your classic markers, you can do that, or you can switch back to the bullet point or whatever. It really opens up your options for projects using just one material. So that part is super cool. So there was two other sets of things that I wanted to talk about in terms of how to use them. So the first is kind of using the marker solo. and then using them with other pens. My writing is completely out of the hook today. So using them solo, there's a couple of things to know. The first one is that you can do a lot with them and really you're going to learn the most just by playing with them. Um, you can watch a lot of tutorials on YouTube. There's tons of great ones out there. Absolutely recommend it. Most of what I learned was just from doing this a lot and figuring out how they blended together, what happened if I kept layering them. And eventually I got to the point where I felt pretty comfortable with what they could do. Um, play with different line weights, play with different kinds of strokes, play with dots, like figure out what kind of textures you can get from this pen because then you're gonna know how it's gonna serve you the best. I live almost exclusively with the brush tip. I wish I could tell you there was a specific reason for it other than I just like it, but there isn't. I just like it. Um, I find that the chisel has its uses, but I mostly end up using it for doing borders when I'm working on things. I don't like the heavy square edge because inevitably I do that and it just doesn't look pretty and it annoys me. So. You can blend Copics. That's probably my favorite thing about that. I think I've said it probably four or five times now. So let's give you an example. So, color this in here. So two of the ways that you can blend Copics. You can blend a Copic into itself by just going over it repeatedly, which will darken it. Or you can blend it into another marker like I just did by taking one over the other and eventually they will blend together. This went together easy because we were dealing with greens. So this was a blue green and this is a green. So you're within related color families. Our saturation number is close. So this is an eight and this is a nine. And our, or sorry, our brightness numbers eight and nine are really close. So that's gonna work out well together in terms of intensity. And our saturation numbers are kind of like the four is a moderate and the two is the most saturated and they're pretty close together. They're more close together than if they were, you know, a one and a seven kind of thing. So these are going to blend together really well without too much comment. Uh, you can do it with a different color family. So let's try this. But just like basic color mixing theory, you're going to get colors in the middle that are not necessarily going to be harmonious. So if you don't know much about color mixing, it's the basic theory of uh, primary colors, red, yellow, blue, mixing to make secondary colors, orange, purple, and green. And usually if you add any primary to any secondary, you're gonna get brown. And so that's kind of a little bit of what we're seeing as I layer these ones. So you can see how what's going on with this square here looks a little bit brown and a little bit purple. And that's because the blue pigment in the blue-green marker is mixing with the red pigment in the vermilion, and it's giving us this odd kind of purple shade. So if you keep blending, you will eventually get a fade through here. And it'll just take you down that rabbit hole in this middle section. And then if you take the vermilion marker and go to the outside and do the same thing,
you'll be able to just go over it until that line softens. And what's happening is that the alcohol solvent that's carrying the dye in each of these markers is blending with the alcohol solvent that was already down on the paper. And it's just mingling those um, pigments together within that medium. It is going to be harder for you to blend colors that have radically different uh, saturations. So the vermilion has a saturation of zero and the blue green has a saturation of four. So this just doesn't have the same kind of push power as this does. It's not as heavily saturated. Um, so you can see that I was having some luck on the edges, but not a lot, not nearly the same amount that the teal was able to kind of push away when we were doing the initial border swap. But you can tell just from this that you can get some really cool effects in the middle by blending colors that are radically, radically on a leg. So that's basic blending. Um, you can also dip things into standing fields of color. So let's do this with a lighter pen because that will be a little bit easier to see, maybe. So we have this field of blue here. One of the great things about Copic is that you can take a lighter color and drip it into an existing darker color and it will push out the pigment underneath and let you lay in the pigment that you're putting down on top. So this is really cool, in my opinion. Um, I don't know of many other systems that can do this for you. Uh, watercolor paint comes the closest, but in terms of like a pen and ink system, uh, alcohol-based markers, as far as I know, are the only ones that can do this. I don't think it's exclusive to the Copic line. I think it's exclusive to the type of media. Um, but it's really neat, and it gives you some options for doing a burnout effect as you're drawing, um, creates some really interesting high lines and shadows. So that gives you an option that you might not have had otherwise. It also gives you the option of, where is my clear colorless blender? So Copic comes out with a colorless blender. And what this is, is literally a marker of just clear blending fluid. I tell you it's clear because the purple is alive and well on this marker. Apparently I was coloring purple with it the last time I was using it. Um, so this marker is literally just the alcohol solution that suspends the pigment and or the dye sorry and you can use it to just carve in and create shapes in a much broader way and you just go back and forth until you get what you want the important thing to kind of remember is that this will still keep developing for a couple of seconds after you pull your pen away so you may want to check in on it a few times before you keep going. I really dig the colorless blender. Um, I think it's one of the most interesting aspects of this marker system. You can use it to help kind of blend out colors that are less uh, inclined to cooperate in other situations. Just be aware that you're going to create some fade of whatever's going on underneath it and that eventually the color that you're laying over will pick up on the marker tip. So you may want to just brush it off when you're done until you get a clear blend again. Um, I really do need to replace the tips on this. That's amazing. In the vein of reinking colorless blenders, you can get different sizes of bottles of the colorless blending fluid. I really like this for making maps with. Um, it's a new technique that I've just started playing with. I am not 100% confident with it just yet. But what I've started doing is laying down a panel of color with the wide tips because I'm trying to find ways to use them that I don't normally do. And then I can take the blending fluid and I can kind of, oh, was it closed off? Sorry, I thought I had this planned out, but I didn't. I can take the blending fluid and I can squirt it onto the color plane that I'm working on and manipulate it with a brush and what it'll do is it'll start pushing out the fluid. Like you can see it happening there. And I just let it go until it's dry. But it's a really interesting way of carving out um, water bodies, in my opinion. It creates some really interesting shorelines. Uh, I did an entire 
background with it once just brushing it like after doing this just taking and using a brush to kind of manipulate where else it went on the page and the effect was interesting I don't know that I'd continue to do entire maps in it but it was fun to play with for now so I'm not quite at the point where I'm going to give a tutorial on that because I'm still not sure how to get consistent results with it but it's fun like you can do some cool stuff with that so I think as a help I'm uninspired and I need to come up with an interesting shape this is a great way of finding water sources on maps in my opinion just drop it down with a, paint, a paintbrush or your fingers or something and see what happens I was saying in the watercolor tutorial video that I really like to be surprised while I'm working and this is one of the coolest surprises that I've been hit with lately all right talked about the refills talked about that layering for glazes so I'm gonna let this keep kind of drying up because it's still a little bit wet to the touch and then I'll show you guys what I mean by this so with blending you can drip stuff into it which will create more squares um, you can pull stuff out or sorry dripping stuff in darker on darker I should have specified this I'm really not as organized today as I'd like to be so that's just dripping stuff in. You're layering one color on top of another. There's not really big competition um, for markers. It's standard coloring. You would have done this with your Crayolas in elementary school. Then there's the gradients, stuff like that, where you're going one color lighter to dark or one color into another harmonious color. You're doing gradients into non-harmonious colors and kind of seeing what the blending effects for that are going to be. And then you're doing pulling out, where you're using a lighter color into a darker color and it's moving that uh, or you're using the colorless blending fluid one of the other things that you can do is a version of the dripping in and it's just the glazing over so taking a lighter color and you're just kind of adding a lighter color over an existing color and because this area is so saturated with um, the colorless blending fluid this is really punchy I don't know if it's showing up as well on camera as it is on the paper um, but that's a really fun effect that you can play with in terms of picking out a new coastline or a river courseway that kind of thing and what will happen if you do it carefully and with the more transparent colors so we're looking at brightness ranges of like 20 uh, and low saturations so I wouldn't go probably much higher than three is you're going to get the ability to see the color that's underneath just tinted over with the color that you're layering on top and you can do this in multiple layers you can do this in multiple configurations um, again this comes down to kind of knowing what your product is and what it can do for you which really the only best way to deal with that is experience so you can take another lighter color and I can go back into these areas that I've pulled out introduce lighter pigment and I can tint them over again with this purple I don't know if that's as obvious on camera as it is in front of me um, this is really great if you want to add um, highlights or lowlights this is particularly useful if you're trying to do a correction of some kind because you can try to push out the color that's a problem for you and add a color that is going to work better for you which is pretty handy um, and you there's not a limit to how often you can do that so if I decide like that's not quite enough for me I want to add another tone in here it will just keep interacting with the color that is underneath it no matter how many layers you have put down um, and not knowing how it's going to react can be fun it'll give you an unexpected bit of whimsy <laughs> for <laughs> if you're looking to be surprised um, but once you start using them a lot you'll get familiar with the colors that you have and they'll give you a chance to be like oh yeah I have an anticipation that this is going to go down in this particular way and I'm worn out so okay cool and if not then you know um, it helps in my opinion to start with a smaller collection of Copics and really put them through their paces um, because then you'll be familiar with what you're working with and you can do a lot with very little like my like I said my first set was 12 markers and with between them and a colorless blending marker I got a lot of mileage out of them because you can make stuff fade like you can take it with a colorless blending marker and you can make them incredibly thin and pale and blend them out and that gives you the impression of having more markers than what you actually have in front of you 
What else was I going to say? I think we're just about to the end. Um, I am working on the Bristol vellum that I talked about in the last video. Uh, it's my current favorite drawing paper for uh, drawing in general and Copics in specific. Let's see if I can pull this out without jiggling the camera too much. There we go. The biggest thing you need to know about Copics is they are a saturant, so they are going to bleed. So I've been dumping liquid on here. So these were the drops from the ink refill. This was the push out that I did with that a massive amount of colorless blender. This was the hard push. And then these were the squares where I had lots and lots of layers of color. So you're going to get bleed through even on a thick paper. Like this is 140 gram paper. It's, it's not a soft thin paper. It's not the thickest either though, to be fair. Um, so if you're working with a lighter weight paper, say a printer paper or a um, like standard sketchbook paper, be prepared for this to show through to the other side. It may or may not bleed over onto the next page. I've had it happen depending on how heavy handed I've been. Um, but just be prepared for it for sure to go through the paper that you're working on unless you're working on some of the specialty papers that are designed to prevent that from happening. They do exist. Uh, Copic makes some, there are a couple of other brands out there, um, but they come in pads, not sketchbooks, and I'm typically a sketchbook worker, so that's been limited uh, use to me. Um, if you're worried about it bleeding through, work with a piece of paper between whatever you're working on and the next page. If you're in a book or on your desk, for example, it's no fun to just have stuff end up getting ruined because you weren't quite following through that this was going to bleed through. Um... I've gotten into the habit when I'm using it in my sketchbook of just making sure that I know whatever is going on to the page that I've just worked on. On the back of it, I've got to paste something in because then I'm not wasting that space, but I'm also not ruining anything by drawing it on the other side. I'm going to leave off by showing you guys a couple of examples of what I've done with Copics just for mapping for my own book. And then I'm going to call it for today. So... This is an example of a set of map samples I did a while ago for a commission. Uh, the client wanted to see the variety of density that I can do with my black and white line art and then see what it would look like with color. So this goes from easiest to hardest and then this is the color version. So there's absolutely no difference between these two panels in terms of the black and white. It's just the variation of what the color adds. And so you can see that the color is actually flat. I think there's only three markers, four markers that were used on this entire thing. Uh, I did that deliberately because there was already so much texture going on with the black and white in the trees. Um, you do still get some of the light image, like what you'd see in here that creates the texture. It's just a different color within the foliage. I can make these shadows far more pronounced using marker. I just didn't want to overwork them because there was so much texture going on in other places. Um, I do recommend Googling around. You will find people who are far better with this than I am. When I'm working on maps, I keep my Copics very, very simple because I do favor a heavier line work. And I don't want to draw my attention away from that because it also tends to just make things very crowded, very busy. And then it's not a restful experience for the eye to actually be wandering around this map. The other one is a map that I'm working on for my book. This is my world geology uh, makeup. It's in a D20 style uh, polyhedron, kind of laid flat. And this is done with Copics. I deliberately went out of my way to try and find colors that were harmonious but easy to tell apart because I was using them to kind of start differentiating my landforms and what I wanted to be doing with for that. So I got into map making to start making these reference maps for myself so that I would have them for my writing and it kind of has taken off and bloomed into something else. And the last map is the same thing as the first one except this is all of the underwater topography for my world. So instead of dealing with the continents, I greened those out in a flat green color and then used the Copics to kind of differentiate what's going on on the ocean floors. So yeah, I think if you're into trying it, give it a shot. My suggestion is if you have a Miles near you, which is a craft store, um, they sell packs of Copic markers and I think there's some chow there as well. Um, and you can use the 40% off coupon with it. So it's a good way to get your hands on a set of um, 
starters just to see what you think of it if you like it or not before you have to make a giant investment. Um, I ended up paying between eight and twelve dollars for each of the markers that I own and I kind of wish that I had found a way of making that happen cheaper at the beginning. I do recommend that if you are out to start um, get a set of greys and learn about the chroma of color. It's a really good way to kind of teach yourself basics without getting intimidated by the sheer range of color that's available in Copic lines. Otherwise, I'd just pick five or six of the colors that you think you're going to use well. Maybe do some thinking along how Copic does its color system with the color family, the saturation, and the brightness. Pick yourself a set that you think you're going to use a lot and then just work it out. And for matte making, it's not a bad thing to have the same set of colors all the time because it's just going to make your work recognizable. Once you know what you like and what you don't, just start expanding your collection a couple at a time. So yeah, that is it for me for today. Shorter than last week, but still okay, I think. I am going to put this up, post it to the map group, and then I have a commission for Dexter that I'm getting started on today. I hope the muses are kind. Uh, for all of my American friends, happy Thanksgiving. I hope you guys have a great holiday. And I will sign off. See you guys next week. Catch you later.